Dope Adventure. Comes from the uh, Ed. And that's about all the Bulgarian I know, so we're going to go back to English. But uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about the future of cross-platform laser today. There's a lot of ground to cover. Um, I know that English is not the first language here, and I tend to speak fast, so I will try to slow down a little bit. And if somebody gets lost, please start raising hands or something and let me know that I'm talking too quickly. Um, I also know that some folks out there have problems when there's fast-moving imagery on a screen, and I have a lot of demos that require me to zoom in and out and back and forth, and if this makes you motion sick, you may want to look away during those demos or maybe find another session before I get too far in. So we're going to talk about several ways to deploy a Blazor application today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Blazor WebAssembly. In case you haven't heard of it, we'll do a little uh, bit of exploration on what exactly it is. Uh, we'll talk about a bit about Blazor Progressive Web Applications, or PWAs. Uh, we'll also talk about Blazor on Electron and Blazor Hybrid. And the whole point of all of this is to try to make sense of this multi-platform madness that we have going on. We have all of our devices that we use, our Android devices, our Apple, Mac, uh, and our browsers everywhere. And we'd like to try to target as many of these platforms as we can with the least amount of code as possible, right? So we're going to start with a little bit of an overview of what Blazor WebAssembly is and some of the implementation details on it. And we're also going to talk about responsive web design because that's one of the things that allows us to target multiple platforms with web technology only. So what is Blazor? Hopefully most of you are getting familiar with it. It's been out for about five years now, but we'll do a little brief overview here to catch everybody up in case you haven't heard of how it works. If we talk about the web and how it works without Blazor, we're talking about writing JavaScript. If we write JavaScript, we send that JavaScript file down to the browser. It parses, compiles, and turns that JavaScript code into bytecode inside the browser. That bytecode gets executed and integrates or talks to the DOM to work with the DOM APIs, do things in the browser. And then WebAssembly came along. And WebAssembly allows us to do that parsing and compilation of our code outside the browser which means we can use languages that are alternative to JavaScript. And we can compile C++, uh, C++ code externally, turn that into WebAssembly code, send that to the browser, and skip that parser and compiler internally in the browser, give it that bytecode, let it execute. And that's how Blazor was born. Uh, the folks over at Microsoft took the .NET runtime, they compiled it to uh, WebAssembly, and then we can send our DLLs or our .NET executable code directly to the browser, and it will run inside of that .NET runtime in the browser. Those things interact directly with the DOM, and then we don't have to write JavaScript. A lot of us .NET folks don't like to context switch. We like to stay inside of one tool chain, and uh, we're pretty happy with our .NET uh, frameworks and tools. So WebAssembly, I mentioned here a few times, um, there are some caveats to using WebAssembly. So in, Web or in Blazor, the .NET runtime is compiled to WebAssembly. Uh, your assembly or your .NET files are not. Your DLL files are not. In most recent versions of .NET, this is a possibility now, but uh, it hasn't always been. And typically, it's not the most productive way to work with uh, Blazor and .NET. So it can expand the file sizes and things like that. So typically, we're shipping DLL files to Blazor. Now, when we're using this mode of operation inside the browser, it works similar to how the CLR works on the desktop. But there's a major difference here because the CLR uses just-in-time compile. 
Uh, in .NET 8, this changes a little bit. There is something called the JIT interpreter that uh, tries to alleviate some of this. Uh, but in uh, all intents and purposes here, uh, the takeaway is that Blazor on the browser is not quite as fast as it is on the desktop. Uh, that JIT compiler that we have on the desktop um, translates to probably a 30% increase in performance on the desktop. So does that mean we can't do CPU-intensive tasks in, in, in uh, WebAssembly and in uh, Blazor? Um, typically, we don't want to do that, right? We don't want to put really heavy loaded items into the browser and have those things execute. Uh, Blazor is exceptionally well at doing web UI, forms over data, those type of things, but not really great at heavy lifting stuff. And we want to do that CPU intensive task stuff on the, um, on the server and put it behind maybe a web API and uh, use that as our infrastructure to do that heavy uh, processing. Uh, think of maybe uh, document processing libraries, like the one we have at uh, Telerik with our Telerik UI for Blazor. Uh, not something we would generally run in the browser. We'd rather do that on the server where we have uh, much more robust uh, computing power. And that, that setup works really great with WebAssembly. Along with this, we can add responsive web design. Responsive web design is a technique that allows our HTML to adapt to different screen sizes. And if we open our application on a mobile phone, it will adapt the UI for a better experience on a mobile device. And I actually took the time to write kind of a demo application. Um, I, just a screenshot here, because I have a lot of ground to cover. I don't want to get into trying to run this live. But this was a, um, a demo app that I wrote called Blazeport. It's a um, kind of like an Uber for space. And I thought it would be fun to kind of practice some of my Blazor skills here. And I wrote it to be a responsive web application. So it looks good on a web app or a mobile device. Uh, it looks great on a tablet and even better on the desktop. But the main thing is it adapts to each screen size to make sure that the user has a good experience. And this should be the gold standard here for writing Blazor applications if you intend to do any kind of cross-platform development uh, because we're going to be seeing in a short bit that we can reuse our markup and our styling to do uh, desktop, mobile, and web applications all in one code base. And for those things to work on all screen sizes, we need CSS and HTML code that can adapt to those screens. So Blazor with responsive web, even though we can write uh, responsive web applications that run on all these screen sizes, we're still missing some of the things that we get from deploying directly to, say, an app store. So we can't publish a PW, or sorry, we can't publish a responsive uh, WebAssembly app to the app store. It doesn't get that desktop icon experience or the, the home screen icon that you might have on an Android or iOS device. And it doesn't have access to device uh, hardware APIs, things like that. And as I mentioned, WebAssembly even though it's great at UI tasks, it's not running the full speed of the .NET runtime that we would get on, say, a desktop experience. So what can we do about that? Uh, we can explore another option called a progressive web application. So we can build a PWA with Blazor. So let's talk a little bit about what PWAs are. Uh, PWAs are web applications that use service workers, manifests, and other web platform features to create desktop-like experience. Um, I like this quote from Mozilla because it says, on par with platform apps. Uh, it says on par with. It doesn't say exactly like 100% like platform apps. There's a little bit of marketing in there, I believe. But what does it give us? Okay, it gives us an installable application, makes it discoverable because we can, in, uh, since it's uh, installable, we can actually submit this to some of the app stores. 
that makes it discoverable by uh, people that are in the app stores searching for apps. Um, we need to use responsive web design here. So we're going to carry over what we just learned a minute ago about responsive web applications. Uh, they need to be network independent. So they have to have support in offline mode. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and they need to be secure. So uh, they have to sit behind HTTPS. And I really hope everybody's using that these days. I think that's pretty standard now. Um, every PWA has to fit a set of requirements before it's allowed to be called a PWA. Um, and browsers like Edge and Chrome will accept the fact that it is a PWA and let you install it. It has to have a web manifest file. And we'll talk a little bit more about that manifest file and what it contains. And again, I said it has to be behind an HTTPS domain. Um, it has to have an icon file that represents what the home icon or the desktop icon would uh, look like on that device. And it has to have a service worker that allows the application to work offline. Now, this is kind of a gray area. Um, that manifest file could contain a definition for a service worker that says that the offline mode is just to display a page that says, hey, you're offline, and the app doesn't really do anything while you're offline. But at least it has to have that much. You can't just have an app that crashes if it's offline or throws errors. So you have to have some kind of fail safe that at least tells the user there's nothing useful to do here while you're offline, and that's the best we can do. Um, Chrome, or sorry, Google, uh, makers of Chrome and Android, we're going to change this, by the way, and make it required that there's some functionality, some dedicated functionality while you're offline, and they never followed through with it. They kept kicking that spec down the road and finally just gave up and said, at least it, you know, let the users know you're offline. Um, service workers. I mentioned that in the previous slide. So what exactly are they? Uh, service workers are JavaScript threads. I'm making a point here to point out their JavaScript. Because we're .NET developers, we're using Blazor. What's the point of using Blazor but to write less JavaScript? So they are JavaScript. What they do is they intercept network calls and requests. They're mainly used to like get and set cache for that offline mode, things like that. They can also help deliver push notifications, subscribe to notification services, and that type of thing. Um, and PWAs, I mentioned, perform a platform-like experience. Uh, like experience, in quotes here, uh, because they're not exactly the same as the desktop, but pretty close. So if you go to this website, this is a Mozilla website, by the way. It's called What PWA Can Do Dot Today. It's actually a really nice little demo site that you can download uh, directly the source code from it. Um, you can install it directly on your device. And you can test out some of the features that you get from a PWA application. Uh, things like um, authentication, thumbprint, you know, biometric authentication, NFC, Bluetooth, um, uh, access some of the sensors on a device, things like that. You can do from a progressive web application uh, using browser APIs. Uh, JavaScript is required, by the way, to do all of those things. Sometimes there's NuGet packages that help cover those bases. But for all intents and purposes, there's some JavaScript involved. So let's take a quick look at uh, what generating a PWA application in Blazor looks like. How difficult is that? I said it needed a manifest file. It needed some service workers and things like that to be um, an actual PWA app. Um, and for most of the demos here, I'm just going to run some videos. It's better than having um, fails on stage and trying to troubleshoot things for a live audience. So you won't see me touching the keyboard. Um, but we are going to look at some code here. So the first thing we do is click File New Project. And then we're going to choose the Blazor Web App template from Visual Studio. You can run these on the command line also, by the way. Um, and there are similar templates and switches for those. Uh, all you have to do is check this box that says Progressive Web Application. Um, and 
it will add the required files for a progressive web app. And I showed this to some of my good friends here. Alyssa, she was one of them that just, I think she left the room. But uh, apparently Angular doesn't have this cool stuff where you can just check boxes and it magically gives you things for free. So this is a little bit more of a task on some other platforms I heard. But we select progressive web app. And when we do that, if my slide advances, here we go, uh, we get a manifest.json file in our project. And inside that manifest.json file is uh, kind of a template for us to follow to fill out all of the properties for that application. And in here, you'll see things like an application name, um, the URL for it, theme color, um, the icons for the application. These are all the required things that are needed for a PWA to be considered a PWA by your browser. So Microsoft gave us that for free out of the box. And it also gives us a set of service workers. So in here, you'll see service workers uh, JS and service workers.publish.js. So there's two sets of service workers. One is for the app when it's running in a published mode, and one is for the app when it is in development mode. Um, these can be kind of difficult to debug. And there's even a note in here that's probably a little hard to read up on the big screen, but it says, in development, always fetch data from the network and do not enable offline support. This is because caching would make development more difficult. Um, changes would not be reflected on the first load or after each change. So there's, there's some landmines to hit in here. It's not... Um, it's, it's not incredibly difficult to work with, but there are some things that you need to be aware of as you work with PWAs. And in the uh, published version of it, you will see some events in here, like on install, um, on activated, on fetch. And again, this is where you would write some JavaScript to set up things like caching for your offline mode, implement push notification services, and things like that. So that, that is where you would do that type of work. But again, it is in JavaScript. Uh, if we run a PWA application, this is still the same one out of the box. We get an install icon that pops up in the browser. And notice the Chrome drop away from the browser. No more URL bar. It acts like a desktop application. So this means we get things like a preview on the taskbar. Um, we get an icon on the taskbar. Um, we get the ability to uninstall. Um, you get an uninstall experience from Windows as well now. Um, we can also pin it to the taskbar. We can on-pin it, um, add those to our start menu. And uh, if we close the application, you can see I just reopened it from the taskbar. So we don't have to type that in a URL anymore. Um, it, it acts very much like a desktop application. Okay? But there's still some things missing, right? I said platform-like. There's little, little nuances in, in the branding around this stuff. Uh, we can pu publish to the App Store. Um, Apple's gotten a lot better at this as of late. Uh, for a while, they wouldn't let you. Um, there's also some surprise App Stores that you may not consider um, App Stores. Like, uh, how many people knew that a PWA works on the Quest? Nobody. Huh? Yeah, they work on a Quest. You can run your 2D Blazor applications on a Quest if they're a PWA. So there's an app store you didn't know you could get to, right? Uh, there's also, uh, again, the limited device hardware and access to those device APIs. Uh, so if you have, say, a, a new feature come out for like an iPhone or something that's brand new, nobody ever thought we'd have that sensor on the phone, you might not get access to that type of thing. Uh, there's just no API for it. And again, we're still running in Blazor WebAssembly. And like I said, WebAssembly is a little bit slower than it is on a platform. What other options do we have? There's some more things that we can do with Blazor. We could run it on Electron using Electron.net. Let's talk a little bit about those. Maybe we can solve some more of the problems that we're having. Uh, so what is Electron? Um, Electron is a 
framework for building cross-platform desktop applications with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Note the word jo uh, dot, uh, desktop there. Um, they're very specific. That is for desktop and not mobile. And a lot of people use it. A lot of big companies. Um, I'm sure at least uh, everybody has touched one of these apps, if not more than one of them, at some point in their career. Visual Studio Code probably being one of the most popular in Teams. As much as I want to say, hopefully that's the second most popular. It's probably the first. But uh, Teams, uh, Twitch, WhatsApp, Figma, these are all um, apps that are built with Electron. And the way Electron works is we take a node process and we couple that with an IPC or an inner process uh, communication channel. And it, has a, uh, it can have multiple render processes. Those render processes use Chrome under the hood. Um, and what this does is it wraps the application in a native shell, so it runs on that platform um, as a native application, and it can interface with the operating system. And that means it can provide some platform UI as well. So it can provide some native Windows and native Mac desktop UI. But uh, the big piece of that is the operating system. Like, we have OS access, so we get to talk to APIs on the desktop. But that's JavaScript, so we don't want to write JavaScript, right? At least I don't. Um, that's, that's where Electron.net comes in handy. Electron.net is another side project that takes and wraps Electron in a .NET shell. And what this does is one of the processes is replaced by an ASP.NET Core server. Okay. Remember I said there were multiple processes you could have in that IPC channel. Um, there could be multiple render processes. Uh, the folks at Electron.net decided to put a .NET Core process in there, run .NET, um, uh, sorry, ASP.NET Core process. I want to be very specific about that because we're running um, a .NET server there. And it also has a render process. And in that render process, we could put um, a Blazor application. And this gives us C-sharp APIs that are wrapped, uh, or sorry, the JavaScript APIs in Electron.net are wrapped in C-sharp um, API layers. So we don't have to write JavaScript code. And we still have access to the operating system and some platform UI. And when I looked at this previous chart, I thought, man, this, this probably is like really difficult to set up. I don't know if I want to go through all this configuration. And then I actually sat down and got off my lazy ass and looked at it. And I thought, uh, how hard could it be? Let's find out. So let's, let's take a look. Um, we're going to first start a Blazor server app. And I know we've talked about Blazor WebAssembly a lot. The difference here is we need Blazor server because this is running an ASP.NET Core server under the hood. And uh, it is going to talk to the Electron app through that IPC channel. Um, and it's going to offer us a much better experience than trying to just host the WebAssembly application inside of it. Um, I am noting here that it is on .NET 5. Uh, Electron.NET seems to stay about two versions behind uh, the latest version of .NET. So with .NET 8 coming out uh, next November, um, they are still on .NET 6. So it does lag behind quite a bit. So I did notice that. Um, and I just created a Blazor server application and for sanity's sake ran it uh, to show you that this is just a Blazor server app. Um, so most notably here, no WebAssembly. So what's nice is um, uh, a, an ASP.NET Core app is running the full .NET framework uh, with its full um, platform capabilities, meaning you get 100% of .NET speed. To get this to be a Electron application, we're going to go into NuGet and search for Electron, and we're going to install the Electron.NET API package. And when we install this, um, we're going to uh, put it, uh, you know, we're just adding this package, but we also need to add the Electron.NET CLI package as a global install. And I've already done it um, off 
camera here. So we also have that pre-installed on our system. So just take mental note that there is a CLI involved here that is a global tool. All right, so we've installed some packages. So how do we change our Blazor server app into an electron.net application? So the first thing I'm going to do is go into my configuration. Configuration has changed a little bit of the structure, but for all intents and purposes, um, we're just going to call the web builder, use Electron. Uh, some of the uh, look and feel of the application, or the, the code here might have changed in, in recent versions, but it's, it's about the same still. Then we'll go in and add some services to the app. So we're going to go into services. And in services, we'll say use Electron. This is going to set up any um, dependency injection that's needed by the Electron app and services that belong to it. And of course, we're adding some using statements as we go along. And then the final step here is to do a task.run um, Electron window manager create new window async. And what this does is it tells the Electron app to boot that Electron shell. So this is going to wrap the application in the Electron shell. And now our ASP.NET Core app is a desktop application. Um, and then we need to do one final configuration here, and that's to run the command line tool. And we are going to call electronize.init. And when we do that, it is going to write to our project config file, or our csproj file. And it will change it. Um, so that .NET knows this is now an electron.NET um, application and not a server application. And what's really interesting is up at the top of uh, the app here, um, it's, again, probably a little hard to see in the back, but the, the uh, icon for start for the, uh, in Visual Studio is actually recognized now that we've run the init that is no longer a server app but it is a, um, an electron.net app. So it actually says electron.net app, and I can start it. So we'll go ahead and start up that electron.net app. Remember last time it popped open in the browser. Now we've got a, um, a command window opening up here, and it's doing a little bit of configuration. And you'll see that behind the scenes, electron.net is installing NPM packages. So there is a node server in there. Uh, it's abstracted away, so we don't have to deal with it. And pops up a desktop application running Electron. Remember that diagram I showed you? It looked like it was going to be difficult. You add three configuration statements, sell it to init, and now it's a desktop app. Wasn't that bad. Um, I tend to be hesitant when I look at stuff like that and think the worst, but it actually wasn't that bad. So that's fairly impressive, right? It's running on the desktop, but uh, we're really not taking uh, real advantage of what uh, we've just been given from electron.net. So let's go ahead and update the index page and let it read from the device's file system. So what I'm going to do here is set up some using statements and some HTML. And the first thing I need to do is go ahead and add the electron um, uh, the Electron APIs and bring those into scope. So I'll say using uh, electron.net. We also see system.io in here. It is a .NET app. So we're going to use the uh, built-in file I.O. there. Um, electron.net APIs and API entities is going to give us a little uh, bit of help uh, when we go cross-platform. Uh, so we're going to set up some razor code. We're going to do a for each loop that's going to take in a list of files, and then we'll write out the file name uh, into uh, what is essentially an embedded browser. And then we'll use the uh, .NET system.io uh, API to go ahead and fetch that, um, that data from, uh, from the desktop uh, operating system. So you can see we have um, our array of files. We're going to start with an empty array. And then when uh, the application initializes, uh, we will call uh, electron.net get app or get path async. And 
pass in a path name of documents. And what this is doing is it's normalizing between Windows and Mac OS so that when we call a path, we don't want to pass in a hard-coded string because that might be different from platform to platform. So this is going to help us with that. So we get an enumerated uh, value here that we can pull in as documents. And depending on what platform that executes on, it's going to get the right documents folder for us. Uh, we'll go ahead and call the directory get files. This is from uh, .NET system IO. And we'll pass in that path we got from Electron's API. And then we'll write those files out to the browser using Blazor. So go ahead and run that application again. And when it pops up in the browser, we're actually going to call out to the Windows operating system in this case, because I don't run Apple devices myself. Uh, it's each their own. Uh, but you can see uh, in the Hello World here, I have a uh, unattractive UI, but at least it has the file names in it. So this is all files from my documents folder um, on my PC. Okay, that's pretty cool. We, get, we just got platform access there. Um, and we can run them using .NET um, APIs we're familiar with. So we solved a lot of problems. Uh, we can publish to the App Store. It's a desktop application. Um, it has device hardware access. It has the speed of .NET because it's running ASP.NET embedded in this desktop app. Uh, notice all the asterisks, though. This is desktop only. There are uh, mobile versions of Electron, but they're kind of frowned upon by the community. They don't run well. They eat memory like uh, crazy, which means your battery life on your uh, mobile device is going to get destroyed by these things. So um, all the recommendations I've seen are to not do this on mobile. Uh, also, you've set yourself up with a very niche ecosystem, right? Um, if something were to go wrong and there was an error that uh, was deep down inside of this shell somewhere, um, you're, you're going to have to have somebody that knows this interesting stack that you've taken on. So it's a very niche ecosystem of developers. Um, I'm not sure what enterprise support would look like with that. The documentation is sparse. Um, and again, since it's a niche ecosystem, you don't have like, a lot of blogs to go to to troubleshoot or get ideas from. Um, so it does come with some catches. And then Microsoft came out with Maui. So we've got another option. We've got Blazor Hybrid with .NET Maui. And I think Sam talked a little bit about this. Um, maybe some other speakers today have mentioned uh, some of the things that we can do with Maui. So you may hear some things that are repeated, but uh, it's probably all great content to help reinforce some of these ideas of what Maui can do. Uh, so what is Maui exactly? If you haven't heard about it today already, um, and I think the following session is about Maui as well. And David Ortnow is going to be up here. He's a program manager on Maui, so I'm pretty sure that's what he's talking about. Um, .NET multi-platform app UIs, Maui. This is a cross-platform framework that is uh, designed to write multi-platform uh, applications using a shared single code base. Um, it is also the, the, pred or the successor to Xamarin. So this is where Xamarin is going. If you're using Xamarin now, this is the next gen of it. And the promise here is that we can deploy desktop, or, uh, .NET applications to the desktop and, the, um, and mobile uh, ecosystems. And that includes Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android, notably not here Linux. And how it does that is through something called a WebView 2 control. Uh, this is an embedded web technology. It uses Microsoft's Chrome. Uh, when, or sorry, Microsoft's Edge, a Chromium browser, when you're on the Windows desktop, um, it uses um, a version of Safari's engine when you're on Mac, and the respective mobile platforms uh, follow that as well. So you get Chromium on Android and uh, the same Safari core, I can't remember what it's called these days, um, on Apple. You can tell I don't follow Apple stuff too much. Sorry about that. Um, and this lets us put web content in a, a platform application. Uh, some interesting facts, though, about a WebView 2 uh, component. 
Um, you can wrap the entire application in a WebView 2 component and let uh, Blazor take over the entire UI of that application. Or you can just mix in pieces of it. You can just put a component in a web view and just run a single Blazor component. You can mix and match. Um, you can also freely choose between evergreen distribu distribution and fixed versioning. And this has been kind of the crux of these web views before, is that they weren't kind of a standardized thing. And you had to embed these fixed versions of a browser and oftentimes, they were not mainstream browsers like Chromium. Um, they were you know, forked versions of these things. Um, and they didn't support the latest HTML and CSS features. Uh, that's no longer the issue. They actually ship these with uh, the platforms now. So the WebView 2 or uh, WebView components in general have support on device for these things. And uh, we're tapping into that through the WebView component. Um, and they default to the evergreen distribution. Or in other words, you get the latest version of the browser on that platform um, always up to date in your app. It's calling out to the main system's um, version of that browser. Uh, it support, it's supported in Windows 7 and up, and it's not exclusive to MAUI. So I don't know if uh, you were in Sam's session. He likes to talk about this sometimes. Um, you can do Blazor hybrid in non-MAUI applications. If they support the WebView 2 component, you can do Blazor hybrid in those as well. Um, the caveat there is you don't get mobile. You get only desktop, because they're WinForm um, or WPF applications. And how it works um, is relatively similar to how Electron works. So we're wrapping this WebView 2 component inside of a native um, device shell, uh, or the MAUI app. So the MAUI app is a native iOS, Android, Mac OS application, and inside of it is a WebView component. And they're able to communicate um, all through .NET code with each other. And this means we get platform API access. And this is just a uh, cherry-picked list of some of the things that we have and categorized by like accelerometer, application actions, app information. We get things like battery um, and um, sensors like uh, orientation and whatnot. So let's take a quick look at a Blazor hybrid demo. Um, you will see preview here. It's no longer in preview. It's just a little bit older of a capture of the process. But we start a brand new .NET MAUI Blazor app. This is a template that ships with .NET 7 and 8. Um, I can't remember if it shipped with .NET 6 or not, but it's definitely with .NET 7 and 8 now. And we'll go ahead and choose that and do um, a new project with it. Uh, I wish I would have sped up the typing here, but I was preparing for another conference, and I recorded every step of the way. All right. So it looks very familiar. looks a lot like a Blazor application, right? So you will notice that we have um, our pages, our counter uh, component, fetch data, and index uh, files. And uh, this, for all intents and purposes, looks just like a Blazor app. We've got main layout, navigation. Uh, we have a WW root folder. Uh, one of some of the things that are different here, though, um, I will highlight in just a second. Sorry, I'm looking for my uh, slide clicker. I dropped into the bottom of the podium somewhere. I guess I'll have to move on without it and find it afterwards. Please remind me to do that, because I will forget. Um, we have an index HTML file, and I want to highlight here that uh, we have a script tag, and that script tag says Blazor WebViewJS. And the reason I'm highlighting this is because on WebAssembly, this would be Blazor WebAssembly.js. The key difference here being that the WebView uh, component runs the platform.net runtime where the Blazor WebAssembly.js file would initialize the WebAssembly version of the runtime. And as I stated earlier, it's a little bit slower. So we want to make sure that that says um, that it's going to use the platform version. 
Uh, we also have an app.xaml um, and a main page.xaml. If you're not a XAML developer like me, don't worry. You're not going to be writing a bunch of XAML. These are just bootstrapping the UI layer of the application for us. And it hosts the web view portion of the application. So we have a web view component here. This is a special version of the web view 2 component. It's called the Blazor web view. Um, it is a web view 2 component that has a host page property that points to our index file that is going to bootstrap our Blazor application. And it also has a root component uh, element that has a selector and a component type. So you'll see that I'm pointing out main here because we're going to target main.razor, which is the router for a Blazor application. So we could target any component in our app, but I'm going to go ahead and choose the router. So my uh, Blazor hybrid application is 100% Blazor uh, and Blazor only for UI. Bear with me for a second, because I lost my clicker, so it's a little manual operation here. All right. Uh, so the first thing I want to do here is run the application. And uh, actually, I think I might have skipped ahead. Uh, after we run the application, it will run on desktop or mobile. Uh, but one thing I want to do here is add some functionality to it, like I did our electron.net app and take advantage of some system I.O. because what I really want to show off here is the fact that it can communicate with the operating system. So we're going to write almost the identical code that we wrote with electron.net. So we're going to write the same for each statement. Um, we're going to use path.getFileName. This all looks very familiar to what we did earlier because it's all .NET code. Um, the only thing that really changes here is the part where we get the folder path. Because we were using the Electron API for that earlier, in here we're going to use the uh, .NET uh, MAUI API. So we'll call environment get folder path, environment special folder my documents, which is exactly what I explained earlier with the Electron.NET app. Um, it is normalizing between Mac OS, Android, iOS, and uh, Windows to get the my documents folder. Um, it's normalizing mobile as well, so it's a little bit um, more involved when we get to the part where we read the files. Uh, we actually need to create a file to get any kind of output from this. And that is the result of using uh, this with a mobile device. So um, when we're working on mobile, there's a little bit of a different context that we have to keep in mind. Because on a mobile device, when I say my documents folder, uh, the apps are sandboxed on a mobile device. You don't get access to the root my documents folder on an Android or iOS device. That's not a thing. What you get access to is the application's documents folder that is specific to that application and that application only. And the applications cannot talk between each other's file systems. Uh, that is a security feature on all mobile devices that I'm aware of. Um, so in order for me to actually see an output here, I have to create a file. Uh, because there's no files existing on my Android emulator, it just wouldn't output anything. So I have a create file routine in here. And similarly, I just get the files from the directory, pass in that documents path, and uh, get the files back out. So we'll go ahead and run. Oh, thank you. Uh, except I can't plug it. I don't have USB ports, not, not standard ones. They're USB-C, but thank you. Um, when we run the application, you can see I retrieved that file that I also just created. Uh, so I am doing file I.O. both read and write from an Android device, um, all using .NET code. And um, the UI for this is 100% Blazor and HTML, CSS, uh, those type of things. Okay. 
Um, in this drop down, thank you very much. You're more than enough help here. You guys are amazing. Uh, we are going to um, run this on a Windows device now. So I'm just going to run this as a desktop application. Same code. I didn't change anything. I didn't recompile any of that. I just went and hit run again. Uh, I just changed the context or the target. And now it's a Windows application running inside of a Windows shell. Notice we have some debugging tools up at the top. Um, I have a counter component, fetch data, those type of things, and my folders or contents from my documents, just like I had with the Electron app. So I just gained two more um, deployments uh, for iOS and Android. OK? So we can do all of that, and they are true hybrid applications. I can, if I do know um, XAML um, or I have maybe an app that I'm migrating from XAML to Blazor, I can mix and match these things if I'd like to. And because they are all .NET, they can share a service and communicate uh, from one UI to another and share state. So that's pretty cool. They can, co they can uh, communicate in real time here without any um, special setup. Um, and uh, refresh both UIs at the same time. So um, with this, we can build true hybrid apps in every sense of the word. Um, they're hybrid UI. They can contain both XAML and uh, web UI, but they also can run everywhere. They can run on Windows. They can run on Android, iOS, et cetera, and also in the browser. So I'm going to show you that next with another demo. Um, this one I have the live code for. I like this one in particular. Um, this is an application that runs on, uh, actually, it is up and running already, because sometimes deploying these to an Android device can take some time. So I went ahead and spun this up ahead of time. So it's already running. And we've got this, web, desktop, and mobile application. Um, the smaller version of the app that looks like the browser version is the desktop. This is a desktop app. Um, this is my Android emulator. And this is the web application, all running the same code base. So how do we set that up? I'm not going to show all the individual steps. I do have an ebook on it, which I'll link to in the resource slide on how you can configure this. It's actually, um, it, it takes a few minutes, but it's not um, really that difficult. It involves creating a couple different projects and just linking them together. So we'll start off by a little exploration of what's in the solution here. We've got um, a couple projects. We've got a Blazor app. We've got a Blazor uh, app.maui.server. We even have tests. We have unit tests for all the UI in here. Um, and then we have the Blazor WebAssembly host. So let's talk about what each one of these does. We'll start here. This is a. Um, it's called Blazor App, but it, this is a Razor class library. If you're not familiar with a Razor class library, it is exactly how it sounds. It's a class library that's dedicated to Razor components, which is the component model for Blazor. So the Blazor app has all of the components for the app in it. And when I mean all of the components, if you're familiar with Blazor, you probably already know this, but everything in a Blazor application um, is a component. So my pages, my routable pages, are components. And all of the uh, markup uh, and all of that are in components as well. Um, some of those things are routable, and those components are pages. So uh, the term components is, is kind of a global thing in Blazor. So you'll see this has the page directive of uh, the index or root path here. And we have our, round, um, our counter component routed here. And what's nice is uh, these Razor class libraries, I can still have the routing inside them. And when the host, the, either the WebAssembly app or the MAUI app, pick these up, it recognizes that routing. And I don't have to specify special routing just because it's running on the web or desktop or whatever. Uh, the Blazor router understands that and links everything together. 
So I can put pretty much my entire application and all of uh, the code for it in this Razor class library. And the only thing missing from this Razor class library is the shell that executes it. So that's what the rest of the app does. So if we look at the Blazor Maui app, the Blazor Maui app lacks a components folder. There are no components here except for the ones that are responsible for bootstrapping the UI. So you will see um, a main, dot main uh, page dot .xaml file and uh, imports.razor just for bringing in some namespaces and whatnot. But you don't see any pages or components in here that uh, have any UI in them. And what it does is, um, if we right click on dependencies here and do add project, you'll see that it is referencing the Blazor app or the, um, the Razor class library. And that's the only dependency that it has. And that's where it gets all of the routing and UI and uh, core logic for the application. The rest of the Maui app is just bootstrapping. It's just booting it up. Uh, let's go down to the WebAssembly app. Same idea here. Uh, we have a Blazor WebAssembly app. No pages, no components. They're all in that external library, that same Blazor app library. So if I were to click on dependencies here, you could see that's the same box being checked. Uh, it's just that Blazor app um, there. One small notable difference here is we do have an index file in both. And what this is doing, if we look at both of them, let's pull it up side by side, or top to bottom here might even be easier to see. Um, they are essentially the same except for one line of code. And if you remember what I said earlier about these, they're very important. You want to make sure when you set this up, if you want to run both web and desktop, that the Maui app says Blazor WebView and that your web app says Blazor WebAssembly. And if you were to try to make these uh, one, uh, one index file, you would end up with WebAssembly running on Maui, and then you would lose your performance benefits. So you want to make sure that your Maui app says WebViewJS. So I just wanted to point that out. We share everything else pretty much, except for that index HTML page. Um, we can, uh, we can write services for each of the applications as well. So uh, we can abstract things like, um, let's go back to our Blazor application under components. You can see weather.razor. Uh, we want to put everything behind a service. Because when we're running from Maui, we might have different ways of fetching some API. Uh, uh, web APIs. We may have some different forms of caching. Maybe we want to get it from disk and not from the web. We have options we could use here. So we could use interfaces depending on where the application is being deployed and implement those interfaces differently on each platform. And the way we would do that is either on the WebAssembly app or the Maui app, inside of Program CS, we would just uh, change the service there. So the implementation of that service would change uh, from the web or the Maui platform. Some nice flexibility that we have there. So we're starting to run low on time here, so I'll get to the final um, pitch, and that is to compare these things together. So we've kind of slashed a lot of things off that list with Maui. It's a really good option. There's still reasons you might want to use the others, but this is tre um, trending to be the most favorable uh, one to get all of the things done. The only missing link here is Linux. And I believe Electron.net supports Linux, so if you really want Linux, you could go the Electron.net route. If you want to kind of compare these all together, we could do that. If you want to publish to the store, you've got Blazor Hybrid and Blazor Electron. Um, Remember, Blazor Electron, though, isn't going to publish to Android and iOS stores. But uh, PWAs can sometimes be limited on, on Apple devices. But again, they've made strides to make that a lot better. I don't think those issues are quite the same anymore. 
Uh, with platform access, uh, we've got pla platform access through Maui or through electron.net. Um, this isn't necessarily the same on a PWA. We use uh, the JavaScript APIs to get um, access through the PWA. Um, on Blazor Hybrid and Blazor Electron, we have a .NET platform runtime. Uh, so we have the full speed of Blazor, or so, sorry, the full speed of .NET. Um, on Blazor PWAs, we have to rely on WebAssembly because it is running in the browser. Uh, so there is a little bit of a speed hit. You're only really going to see that again, though, if you're doing some heavy processing that you um, processing that you didn't put up on the server, but you want to run on the client for some reason. <clears throat> Uh, for desktop support, uh, Electron is the only one that we have Linux, uh, or sorry, Electron and PWAs support Linux. Uh, desktop, um, or, or sorry, Blazor Hybrid is Windows and Mac for the desktop, no Linux. For mobile, um, Blazor Hybrid apps are essentially Android applications. So you could, in theory, push those into the Android, the iOS, and the Quest stores. Okay? Quest is one of my favorite things. You'll see it coming up more often when I talk about things. Uh, the PWAs can go in there as well. Uh, so we've got uh, all of the popular platforms for mobile supported by those, but not Electron. So here's all of your choices for the future of Blazor on uh, multi-platform. They all come with some kind of caveat, right? Uh, whether it is JavaScript uh, with Electron, uh, you're still probably going to want to have somebody that knows how to write some JavaScript on Electron or Blazor or PWAs. Uh, Blazor Hybrid, um, there may be instances where you run into some XAML uh, where you need to kind of tweak some of that, or maybe you're migrating an app. So each one of these has something. Um, and of course, the lack of Linux I know is a big thing. Uh, there's a guy coming up next that you could ask about that if you're really in interested in it. Sorry, David, I don't know if you're here and listening, but I bet you didn't see that bus coming. Uh, resources for all of this. There's some great things in here like ebooks um, on how to set up that uh, Blazor application that runs on web, desktop, and mobile, um, and uh, recordings of this talk that I've given at other conferences. Um, Am I in the way of the QR code? <laughs> I'll move aside here. Um, yeah, so, so make sure you hit the resource, for, yeah, resource page there, and uh, hopefully that answers any more questions you might have. And if it doesn't, come find me at the conference, and um, you can ask me outside the doors here. I should be able to stick around for a few more minutes. And I'm going to go ahead and get off stage because David just walked in. He didn't hear me load the questions about Maui on Linux, I didn't tell you to ask him. I didn't. Um, that, that wasn't me. But thank you all very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>